we have seen that Paul's missionary journeys are coming to a close. He is compelled by the Holy Spirit to drop what he's doing, to get back on the boats and head back to Jerusalem. And the closer he has come on that journey, the more clear it has become that serious trouble is waiting for him when he gets to Jerusalem. And back in chapter 20, he said to his dear friends, uh, the church leaders in Ephesus, that he was going to Jerusalem because the Holy Spirit has compelled him to go. Now, at that point, it seems, he did not have a clear picture of exactly what would happen to him when he got there. Only that, whatever it was, it would be pretty miserable. He said, I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. In other words, I am willing to lay my life down and I might just be called to do so when I get to Jerusalem. But as we said last week, this was the the big point of the passage. The Holy Spirit was revealing that, yes, there will be trouble ahead, not so that Paul could scuttle away, but so that he would stand firm in the face of it. This great revelation was given not so that he could make plans to avoid it, but so that he could prepare to endure it. It's why he was told. And the same is true for you and me as well. In this life, you will have trouble. The aim is not to dodge all difficulty, but to stand firm and to trust God, even in the face of fierce opposition, of persecution, of the general sorrow and suffering of life. Stand firm, trust God, because our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us a future glory that far outweighs them all. Paul knows that trouble is ahead, and yet he goes, because he wants to do the will of God. Just look at verse 13 before we come to today's passage. Paul answered his friends. Remember, they were pleading with him not to go in light of this revelation. Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, the Lord's will be done. That is exactly the right attitude. In all aspects of our lives, that ought to be our desire, that the Lord's will will be done. Because, in fact, he does know best, doesn't he? It reminds me of Jesus over in Mark chapter 10 saying, we're going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man, that's how he refers to himself, the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Jesus said, I am going to Jerusalem and my aim is not to avoid life's difficulties, but to face down the forces of darkness and die in the place of my people. Yes, it's going to be miserable, but don't miss this. Three days later, he will rise. One of his disciples, Peter, didn't much like the sound of this, did he? And he tried to actually rebuke Jesus of all things, tried to give Jesus a real telling off uh, to which Jesus responded, Get behind me, Satan. Why did Jesus use that language in that moment? Because he's just revealed the clear will of God. And then someone comes along and says, I don't think you should do what God has told you to do. Well, who is it who tries to subvert and upset the plans and purposes of God? It is the evil one, isn't it? So Jesus says to him, look, that advice, avoid it, may sound sensible to you, but it's satanic. You're trying to stop me from doing the will of my father in heaven. Get behind me, Satan. Well, a similar sort of thing is going on in the life of the apostle Paul now. He manages to convince his dear friends that he is ready to go to his death. And to their credit, at last, they do say, fine, the Lord's will be done. (laughs) Not ours, which is different to this, and not yours, but the Lord's will be done. And so uh, Paul fixes his face to Jerusalem, where indeed trouble does await. So when we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So they arrive at long last now in Jerusalem. 
And what is the first thing they do after a single night's sleep? After being received warmly, what do Paul and the team do? Well, they host a missionary prayer meeting for the local church. They literally have a missionary prayer meeting. Paul, the missionary, stands at the front. He shares with the brothers and sisters. And the language here is so precise and so helpful for us to think in these terms ourselves. What exactly did Paul share? You and I, I think, would be in awe of Paul. We'd be absolutely in awe of the courage, the theological capacity, the speaking ability of the Apostle Paul. We'd be amazed by him, but Paul is not impressed by himself. And so he reported not what he had done, but what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. You see that? Yet not I, but through Christ in me. This is not being pernickety, this is being precise. Paul reported what God had done And God is the one who gets all the glory. The church in Jerusalem, to their credit, they understand that. Verse 20. When they heard this, they praised not Paul, but they praised God. Isn't that wonderful? A a beautiful understanding of what exactly is going on in the world. The goodness of God is overflowing and reaching all types of different people groups for the glory of his name. I'm sure they honor and respect Paul, and yet they do not deify him or glorify him. It is God who has accomplished this wonderful work. That is beautiful. You know, I love to imagine um, being at these missionary prayer meetings at the early church, that when Paul came home, perhaps to Jerusalem or to Antioch, and began to share with his home churches an update about uh, the work that had been going on. Um, All these things that we've spent months exploring, imagine them squeezed down into an action-packed missionary prayer meeting evening, just relentless godly adventure. Uh, Notice verse 19, Paul reported in detail what God had done. So all the glory goes to him. And then they say, well, look, you've been away. Let us tell you what's been going on here among the Jewish community here in Jerusalem. They said to Paul, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed, and all of them are zealous for the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. In other words, here's the accusation. Paul, the Jews, even Jewish Christians who love the same Lord as you, they've come to see you as a bit of a villain, Paul. And here's why they have been informed, we read, that you've become kind of anti-Jewish in your preaching, that you have disparaged our customs and dismissed our traditions, that you are anti-Jewish now. So here's a question. (laughs) It will sound unrelated, but it's not, okay? The question is, what is Englishness? Or what comes to mind when you think of Englishness? Uh, Obviously, it goes beyond the particular language that we speak, doesn't it? I found a a list of this uh, during the week. You can tell me whether you think this is an accurate list or not. Uh, I should say, take it with a pinch of salt. Okay, there are other things that could be included. Um, Not everyone or anyone enjoys all of these things necessarily, and they can still very much be English. Okay, that's not the point I'm making. But apparently, these things help define a sense of Englishness beyond our language. Let me show you this list. Um, Tea drinking is number one. Uh, Queuing is a a particular favorite hobby of English people, apparently. Um, Politeness a sense of humor, cricket, pubs, fish and chips, uh, talking about the weather, uh, having a stiff upper lip, the monarchy, uh, country gardens, the mighty Sunday roast, uh, famous uh, English literature, uh, various famous cultural landmarks, uh, football, the countryside, the BBC, uh, our national dish, apparently, curry. Um, <laughs> Sarcasm is another one, and Marmite would complete the list. I'm sure we'd have um, contributions of our own. Here's a question, though. When someone who is English becomes a Christian, do they therefore have to refuse to indulge in or enjoy any of these things? (laughs) Sounds silly, right? But they don't have to get rid of these things as long as they understand that they're not saved on the basis of their Englishness. And of course, some people do think that they're saved because they're born into a Christian country or whatever, and they are absolutely wrong about that. Well, it's a similar sort of thing going on for the Jews in this era. Their Jewishness, their particular version of this list, doesn't save them. Only faith in God saves them. But those who have faith in God are, of course, allowed to enjoy the things that make them Jewish in the correct understanding and with the correct context. 
And so they ought to know that, yes, sharing the Passover meal is a beautiful Jewish family tradition. It points to the hope of a deliverer. And Christians even, Christian Jews, would have a a whole new beautiful way of understanding and enjoying that meal. It's a time when they enjoy the goodness of God. The Passover meal can't save them, obviously. Only Jesus can. They must understand that. They are saved only on the basis of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on their behalf. Does that make sense? That's a fairly kind of precise cultural understanding that Paul has been trying to communicate. Nothing wrong with your Jewishness, but your Jewishness cannot save you. You must trust in the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. That is what Paul has been out there preaching. (laughs) Still, back in Jerusalem... All those Jews who have put their trust in Jesus and have have heard of the Apostle Paul out there on the mission field, this false report has reached their ears that he's telling people to be anti-Jewish, to basically despise their family, their history, their culture, their heritage. Nothing could be further from the truth. Paul loves the Jews. Paul loves Jewishness, even. Paul knows and loves the Jewish scriptures more than anyone in this room. Paul has been precise in his language. Jewishness can't save you. Turn from that as your hope of salvation. And yet he's got this reputation now as one who rejects the Jewish way of life altogether. So what shall we do? The apostles and disciples say, they will certainly hear that you have come. So this is their plan. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. This is part of the purification, particularly of those who have taken a Nazarite vow. You might remember there were hints that perhaps Paul had done a similar thing uh, earlier in the text. Then everyone will know that there is no truth in these reports about you, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. We've looked at those things before, haven't we? So you understand the plan then that these apostles put to Paul. Um, I want you to engage in these aspects of Jewish culture publicly, in full view of the people, and expressing your your love for God, your gratitude to him through these Jewish purification rites. And at the end of the days of purification, to bring an offering, verse 26. Now, to be absolutely clear, this is not an atoning sacrifice that Paul is going to be bringing. There are all sorts of sacrifices that are offered at the temple. Um, We would be familiar with this if if this were our culture, but this might be news to some of us. Um, One example would be a fellowship offering. So this offering is not given in the place of the person to receive the punishment their sins deserve. This is simply a way of expressing gratitude and thanksgiving to God. That you would bring the animal, you would have it sacrificed, you would give a portion to the priests, and you would share the rest of it with your family with a particular awareness of gratitude to God. It's a fellowship offering, a thanksgiving offering. And Paul would obviously never bring an atoning sacrifice because he is as clear as day on the fact that the atonement has been made fully. That Jesus has died in the place of his people. But that doesn't mean that he shouldn't be thankful. And if a Jewish way of expressing thankfulness and gratitude is to give a thanksgiving offering, then to Paul, clearly, that is acceptable to him. Um, This, by the way, is exactly what Paul means when he says that he became all things to all people. Remember, he says, to the Jews, I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. I've become all things to all people, so that by all possible means, I might save some. He is absolutely like fastidious, fixed where it matters, and he's flexible where it doesn't. This is what we ought to be aiming for as well, I think. I'm closed-handed about certain issues. We're not going to be budging over these issues. These are like, the core doctrines of our faith. There's no negotiation here. But we ought to be open-handed about a whole load of issues. How does the Bible apply to that question? And two well-meaning Christians may have genuine disagreements and still be very good friends and still remain in fellowship with each other. Closed-handed and open-handed issues. Paul is fixed where he must be and flexible where he can be so that he may reach as many as possible with the good news of Jesus. An equivalent of this kind of practice might be Um, If you were an evangelist and you decided that you would evangelize the vegetarian community, um, you might not turn up at the club picnic uh, munching on a great big meat sandwich. Why? (laughs) Well, because it's just clumsy. It's actively unhelpful for the people that you are trying to reach. Now, if you were in the middle of doing that and I were to ask you about it, you might say, well, look, I'm not a vegetarian. (laughs) I'm just trying to evangelize the vegetarians. For me personally, I'm free in Christ to eat whatever I want to eat. And yeah, you might be free in Christ, but you're still acting foolishly, right? 
If your intention is to win the vegetarians, you should decide, at least temporarily, not because you legally have to, but because you lovingly want to, you should decide to eat the chickpea salad and the beetroot burgers and whatever else they might choose to eat. It's less of a stumbling block to them. And so you understand that Paul is picking up these Jewish practices again, but he's not being hypocritical by doing this. He's just being thoughtful about the way in which he engages with the Jews that he loves and wants to reach and encourage for the Lord. That there are ways in which we can also aim to be all things to all people. I'm flexible where we can be for their sake. So that's the plan. Um, go to the temple, show your love for the Jewish way of life. And surely those rumors about you will all die a death. Let's see what happened. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. Uh, have you ever been a long way from home and by a strange coincidence bumped into someone that you know well and they are also a long way from home? Uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, we went to Kingston Lacey, just around the corner for a nice long walk. And uh, as we got out of the car, we happened to bump into some church friends. Um, not all that unlikely, I grant you, but it's the best I could come up with. Not very far from home. But, uh, perhaps you've got similar stories, but you bumped into a friend on the other side of the world, completely unplanned, completely unexpected. Well, Paul here jumped into, uh, bumped into not a group of friends, but a group of foes at the temple a long way from when he last saw them. I'm sure he's got no animosity against them, but they absolutely hate him. We read that they were from the province of Asia when they saw Paul at the temple. Um, We're not given any more details about where in the province of Asia, but just to remind you that Paul uh, preached all over this region, um, and some of the things that he endured there were genuinely shocking. It was in this province where Paul was dragged out of a city and stoned almost to the point of losing his life. And in fact, the people who tried to kill him only stopped because they thought he was dead. That's how vicious and violent the opposition was against him in this region. Well, a horrendous coincidence, we might think. They've all turned up at the temple on the same day at the same time. You imagine their eyes meeting each other across a crowded temple courtyard. These Jews remember the Apostle Paul. They know him. They know that he is someone who has taught lots and lots of people salvation cannot be found in Jewish circumcision or ceremony, but only in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. They know his message. They hate his message. And so they stir up the crowd against him. Fellow Israelites, help us. This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people and our law and this place. And besides, he has brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place. Now, the Bible makes it abundantly clear that that is a false accusation. In fact, both of these things are false, really, aren't they? That he doesn't teach against the Jewish law and custom, as we've just said. He simply made the case that those things cannot save you. So they're wrong about that, first part. You're welcome to be Jewish, but you must be a Jewish Christian. You must put your faith in Christ. The second part, though, is also wrong. He's brought Greeks into the temple and defiled this holy place, they say. Well, we note here that they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with Paul, and they had assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. They assumed it, and they were wrong about it. Paul had um, apparently brought some Gentiles with him to Jerusalem. Um, Perhaps they were like case studies in the missionary prayer meetings a little bit earlier. Look, genuine Gentiles, and yet they love the Lord. That would be an absolute marvel to the Jewish believers. That would be quite the kind of visual aid as Paul gave his talk. Um, Either way, for whatever reason, he has got some Gentile friends with him. He had taken one of them at least into the city of Jerusalem. And perhaps even, though we're not told this, perhaps he had taken them into the Gentile court of the temple grounds, which was perfectly permissible. There is no way, though, that Paul would have brought them beyond the proper bounds where they were allowed to go as Gentiles. The Jews took the temple in Jerusalem incredibly seriously. And while there was a a Gentile court where you were very much allowed to come and observe if you were seeking the Lord, and perhaps what you saw from your Gentile court would persuade you to be grafted in and to take the rites of circumcision and become Jewish in every conceivable way, the Gentiles were not allowed in the Jewish-only areas of the temple. This is a genuine sign that was posted up around the temple grounds in this era. We read, no stranger, that is foreigner or Gentile, is to enter within the balustrade around the temple and enclosure. Whoever is caught will be himself responsible for his ensuing death. 
They took it that seriously. Still, the Bible says that they had made an assumption here that Paul had brought Gentiles into the Jewish-only areas, and their assumption was indeed wrong. Nevertheless, the whole city was aroused, and the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. Just imagine what is going on in Paul's mind. Complete misunderstanding, a total fabrication, utterly unfair. And yet, Paul must have been thinking to himself in this moment. I can't say God didn't warn me. I was told that something like this would happen, wasn't I? Here he is getting smacked around and beaten to a pulp yet again. And they are actively trying not just to rough him up, but to rob him of his life. They were trying to kill him. Verse 31. So there he is, bleeding again, battered again, aching and thinking, Lord Jesus, I will see you soon. I have no idea why you called me all the way back to Jerusalem just to have me killed here outside the temple. But I can't wait to see your face. I said I was willing to die. Here I am about to die. Jesus, take me to be with you. At which point, if Paul was conscious, he would have heard another commotion. And that is that the whole area of the temple grounds is now being flooded with Roman troops to try and quash this riot. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Let's pause just for a moment to talk about why the Romans were able to get to the temple so very, very quickly. Um, The relationship between the Romans and the Jews is a very interesting one. Um, You probably know this, but the Romans, in almost every case, would conquer a territory and they would insist that the people there pay honor and respect to the Roman gods and forget their own, obviously. And in almost every case, the people groups ruled by the Romans would agree. (laughs) Fine. If that's your condition, just stop killing us. Stop fighting us. We surrender. We'll come under your provision. We'll receive your protection. We'll at least give lip service and say that we're devoted to your pantheon of gods. Fine. (laughs) And in fact, in many cases, they would be quite happy to do so, believing that indeed these Roman gods were more powerful than their tribal gods. And that is why the Romans are so strong, because their gods are so strong. So they would throw out their old gods and devote themselves to these Roman deities. But the Jews absolutely, utterly refused to do that. They would rather die than give up their belief in the one true God. The idea of um, polytheism or idolatry uh, was thoroughly squashed out of them in the Old Testament era uh, through the exiles of the people of God. You remember that they were, uh, Judah was exiled into uh, Babylon And when they came back into their own territory, they never, ever, ever worshipped idols again. That exile was was the end of idolatry as a people group. And so they were so fierce about this, so determined about this, that in their case, the Romans made a very strange exception just for the Jews. They said, fine, we're not going to insist that you worship our gods as long as you are happy to submit to the authority of Caesar. We won't kill you if you'll agree to that. So so they made that exception nowhere else as far as I am aware of. Um, Only the Jews got away with that, and only because they were so militant about their monotheism. So it was that they were allowed to carry on kind of conducting their religious ceremonies. That explains why the temple was allowed to stand, at least for as long as it did. But the Romans obviously wanted to know what was going on in the Jewish world. And so right next to the temple complex, they built the Antonia Fortress, which overlooked the temple grounds. That is why, within minutes of this kind of uproar, the Romans are aware of it, and they have kind of rallied the troops to intervene and put an end to it. The commander came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. By the way, that's exactly what Agabus said would happen, wasn't it? And then he asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another. And since the commander could not get at the truth because of the uproar, he ordered that Paul be taken into the barracks. Again, he hasn't got to drag him across town. He's talking about that fortress that is just next door. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great that he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting, get rid of him. And for today, that is where the scene ends. There's a crowd of people. They falsely accuse a man who has newly arrived in Jerusalem. He's been there just shy of seven days, we read. He has been lied against and maligned. 
The Romans now have him under arrest and the crowd are shouting for his death. Does this remind you of anyone? Isn't it shockingly similar to the fate of the Lord Jesus Christ, who just perhaps two or three decades earlier endured a very similar fate? He, likewise, set his face to Jerusalem, knowing that it would mean death and misery, but determined to do the will of his father entirely. He entered Jerusalem and was warmly received, like Paul entered Jerusalem and was warmly received. And then, in short order, the masses of the people turned against Jesus and the masses of the Jews turned against Paul. They were both arrested though they were both utterly innocent. And indeed, both will die doing the will of their father in heaven and both will rise on the other side of death. Paul is able to rise only because Jesus did so first. Paul is able to live only because Jesus first died upon the cross. Paul goes to glory only because Jesus has dealt with the sin that would have separated him from God forever. And so while Paul and Jesus endure similar circumstances here, I am absolutely sure that Paul will want us to end our time this morning not talking about the courage of Paul, but the courage of Christ, that he would fill our minds and encourage our hearts. Jesus, in fact, endured infinitely more than the Apostle Paul. Jesus was utterly innocent, not just of these particular false accusations, but innocent of all guilt, innocent of all sin, innocent of all crime, perfect and pure all the way through. And yet he willingly went to the cross. He made up his mind not to avoid the suffering, but to endure the suffering for the sake of the people that he loved in accordance with the will of God. It is because of the death of Jesus that you and I can live. It is because Jesus paid it all that you and I need do nothing other than put our faith in him for our salvation. When Jesus hung upon that cross and proclaimed, it is finished, he meant that word, finished. The entire work of atoning for the sins of all his people all over the world and throughout all human history, it was accomplished. It was done. And then he gave up his spirit. Jesus did not accomplish 90% of your salvation and then need you to add to his efforts a little bit of good religious performance. He didn't say, it is almost finished. (laughs) If only they can help me out a little bit. Perhaps they could maybe meet me halfway. As long as they read their Bible several times a week, as long as they attend church services as often as they can, as long as they give generously to charity, I reckon they'll get into glory. No. The death of Jesus means that the work of atonement is done. You do not need to add works to faith in any way in order to get right or to stay right with the living God. That was exactly the message that Paul was going around the world preaching. All you need to do is turn from your sin, put your trust in Jesus. Perhaps you might say something along the lines of, Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I know that I don't deserve heaven, but I want relationship with you. I want eternity with you. I want to be in your presence with your people forever and ever. So, Lord, would you deal with my sin? Would you give me the gift of forgiveness? Would you cleanse me? Would you save me from the consequences of all the evil that I have unleashed in the world? Save me, Lord Jesus, not because I'm so good, but because you are so good. Save me and take me to glory with you. And he has promised that he will answer that prayer every single time. In your own words, however you would say it, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And now for those who are saved, see how this transforms everything in your life. Now the Bible teaches that good works, these acts of our lives that are pleasing to our loving God, They spring out of a heart that has been transformed by his grace. Suddenly you will find yourself able to say, look, I kind of want to read my Bible. That surprises even me. I want to know what God has to say to me, his child. I want to be at church, not because it's always easy or the most enjoyable place in the world, but because it is the will of God for my life. I want to do God's will. I don't want to give up meeting. This is where iron sharpens iron. This is where the body of Christ comes together. This is where God has told me to be. And so I want to be there. And to 
do that because it pleases the God who has saved me. And yes, I do want to serve wholeheartedly. And yes, I do want to try and give generously. Yes, I do want to live in a way that pleases God, not to get right with him, but because I have been made right with him through the death and resurrection of the Lord. And you see how the love of Christ changes absolutely everything in your life. And friend, may it change your heart today as well. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for Paul's courage and for his commitment in reaching out to all kinds of people with the good news of the gospel. We thank you, Lord, that we have been reached in that same way with that same news. And that today you have spoken to us and encouraged us to press on and to persevere in what pleases you. You've called us to turn from our sin and put our trust in you to be saved. And we ask that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would apply this passage to all of our lives, that we may respond to it in the way that we should, for the glory of your name. Amen.